So this was a funny moment because uh, Barry kindly asked me to revive a talk I had given um, to a bunch of computer scientists at this conference and to really reconsider it for social scientists. And I thought this was a fascinating idea. And so I was like, oh, Kate, we should talk about this. This is great. And we talked and we talked and we talked and we slowly ended up writing a paper together and realized that our talking had, had sort of evolved into something that she could discuss, to something that we had done very collaboratively, collaboratively together. So we wrote a paper. It is available for you. So if you don't want to listen to anything that we have to say, you can actually just grab it right now um, and read it and walk out the door. Um, where we start with this uh, is very much uh, with Jeff Bowker's comment, right? Which is, raw data is both an oxymoron and a bad idea. To the contrary, data should be cooked with care. And we thought this was a great way of thinking about what's happening. What we argue is that the era of big data has very much begun. Computer scientists, physicists, economists, mathematicians, political scientists, social scientists of all stripes are clamoring for access to a wide variety of different kinds of data. Data that we see that are health informatics data, bioinformatics data, data that we see from the social media space, data that we see from the census, this whole sort of swarming around what it means to talk about this. And yet there's a lot of open questions that need to be asked, right? Will the large-scale analysis of DNA help cure diseases? Or will it um, usher in a wave of medical inequality? Will data analytics make people's access to information more effective and efficient? Or will it help track protesters in the streets of major cities? Will it transform how we uh, study human communication and culture? Or narrow the palette of research that we see and alter what research means? And these are some of the questions that sort of provoked us to think about it and to really think about what are the new forms of inequalities, what are the major issues that we need to think about. Now to begin, let's acknowledge big data is a dreadful term. Terrible, 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 terrible. Lev Manovich argues that it's used to talk about data that requires a supercomputer, but in many ways we're not actually even interested in size as the primary or salient quality of this. The reason that we chose to co-opt the term big data is that it's become a term of art in a whole variety of communities that must be acknowledged, right? And it's simultaneously a set of relational data that's networked, but it's also a phenomenon of really looking at and trying to connect the dots around different kinds of data. We see it both in the um, industry as a computational move and a set of rhetorics that are taking place. It should be note that while we're here, the big strata conference by O'Reilly is taking place in New York, which is fundamentally becoming the big data space for talking about an in industry. It's also created a certain kind of analytic turn in academia, much of which Christine has pointed to, but is part of a whole set of phenomenon I think we need to think through and critique. So what we've argued is that we actually need to create a space in which the social science community is starting to critique what is happening with big data. We feel as though we have a lot to offer, not just in terms of analyzing data itself, but in offering a critique that can help interrogate what the assumptions and biases are that are very much a part of this new phenomenon, whether it's taking place in industry or whether it's taking place in academe. So how we handle big data becomes extremely crucial, right? What we think about, what we do with it, and what we make meaning from it. I, I really love Larry Lessig, and one of the things I love about Lessig is he, back in his seminal book, Code, he highlights that there are four points of regulation for any sort of system. The market, the law, technology or architecture or code, and finally, social norms. And what we're seeing is, is that tech is moving in a very particular way around big data, often driven by market interests. Law is gearing up to regulate. The regulation is going to look different in the UK versus the rest of Europe, versus the States, versus Australia. But we're going to see a ton of regulation coming into play. But there's a, not a lot of talk about what's happening around social norms and how social norms are playing into this in fundamental ways. This is where we think that social scientists can offer a really brilliant critique of it. So the goal of this talk um, is very much to open up a set of provocations to engage the community of social scientists to think about some of the issues that we should talk about. What we've uncovered here and what we're going to discuss today are about six provocations, and they're really short and simple, but they're just sort of starting points for what we hope is a much broader conversation. So hi, everyone. I get the first provocation, and that is the idea that automating research actually changes the definition of knowledge. And to think about this, I'm going to take us back in time to the early years of the 20th century. So Henry Ford devises a system of manufacturing cars using mass manufacturing automation 
but he also breaks down the basic unit of human labor to its most atomized form to increase its efficiency. And this was seen as the apogee of technological progress, and it was also becoming an orthodoxy of manufacturing. But it wasn't just a new set of tools. What was really profound about the impact of Ford on the first half of the 20th century is that he effectively changed the very definition of labor and what it meant to work and what it meant to work in relation to the society at large. So we would suggest that big data isn't just a set of tools. It's actually a much broader set of approaches that can have a wide impact in terms of our definition of knowledge and how we approach that knowledge. So in this sense, we think in many ways, after Latour, that if you change the instruments, you will fundamentally change the entire social theory that goes with them. So basically, big data stakes out new terrains of objects and methods of knowing. And in some cases, as you can see from our you know, willing researchers here, it can give you the sense of a 30,000 foot view, that you can see the world beneath you, you can see millions of pieces of data, and you can make statements about the society in which those pieces of data are being generated. But in many ways, we think it's not just about scale, and it's not just about perspective. This is actually going to change knowledge at the, at the basis of epistemology and at the basis of ethics. And what I mean by that is that it's reframing key questions about what it is to generate knowledge, to generate research, and what the ethical boundaries are in terms of how we actually generate that research. I'm going to take you to an essay that was written by Chris Anderson, who was the editor-in-chief of Wired magazine. And in it, he speaks glowingly of the petabyte age. And this is what he said. This is a world where massive amounts of data replace every other tool. Out with every theory of human behavior, from linguistics to sociology. Who knows why people do what they do? The point is they do it, and we can track it with unprecedented fidelity. With enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. What do we think? Do the numbers speak for themselves? Well, uh, we think, and possibly some of you agree, that the answer is a resounding no. But we would also suggest that contained in this statement is a particular kind of tell, that in it, the very easy dismissal of all of the other forms of discipline, all of the other forms of knowing, is actually, unfortunately, an underlying current in much of the big data debates that once you have access to this kind of data, that other forms of knowing, other forms of researching, other kinds of questions are somehow not valid anymore. So we think we have to ask some relatively difficult questions about what is essentially here a model of intelligibility for big data before it crystallizes into a new orthodoxy. <coughs> Excuse me, a new orthodoxy. So what are some of the actual problems in terms of how big data works? Well, one of the key issues is around time. And Joy Ito, who is the incoming director of the MIT Media Lab, has, I think, a very useful quote that big data is about exactly right now, with no historical context that is predictive. And I, I particularly see this in relation to the way that Twitter and Facebook data is currently being used. If you think about these sources, they generally have very poor search and archiving techniques. So what we find is that researchers get very focused on the present or the immediate past. So that might mean tracking an election or tracking the finale of a big show like MasterChef or a natural disaster. But what we don't see is a kind of historical analysis. In many cases, it's simply not there. We're talking about very new systems. But Esther talked about longitudinal data. It really hasn't really been built into some of the systems that we're talking about. So in essence, we think that if we're observing the automation of particular kinds of research functions, then we have to consider the inbuilt flaws of the machine tools that we're using. Big data, rather than simply offering new approaches, may also change the meaning of learning, the meaning of research. And with those new possibilities, we also think come new boundaries. So the second provocation is that claims to objectivity and accuracy in big data research are often misleading. And certainly big data offers the humanistic disciplines a new way to claim the status of a quantitative science and objective method. It certainly, without question, makes many more social spaces quantifiable. But in reality, working with big data is still subjective. And what it quantifies doesn't necessarily have a closer objective claim on truth. I think there remains a mistaken belief that somehow 
qualitative researchers are in the business of gathering stories and quantitative researchers are in the business of producing facts. And in some ways, this is our fear that the big data space is actually reinscribing very old debates about scientific method. In some ways, I think the easiest way to approach this is the way that Lisa Gittleman has suggested in a forthcoming book about data, where she says that all researchers, regardless of your stripe, are interpreters of data. All of us are interpreters of data. And she uses this lovely term, data needs to be imagined. It's not something that springs into being. It has to be imagined by a discipline and by a disciplinary institution before it can be considered as data. So in this sense, I think by recognizing that there are these subjective processes inherent in big data, we can begin to assess some of these positions about its objectivity and its accuracy. The other issue we could bring up at this point are the questions of data cleaning and data errors. Uh, many of us here in this room who have dealt with large data sets know that you begin with the cleaning process where you make certain decisions about what kinds of things will be kept in and what sort of things will be rejected from the outset. Now, social scientists have a long history of making that process very apparent, being transparent. But sometimes what we're finding in the, the recent publications in this field is that we're not being told about those very early decisions that, of course, skew the kind of data that we're getting access to. The other issue is straight up errors. And this is particularly true of social media data because we're talking about very fragile spaces. They're prone to downtime. Messages go missing, things get deleted. So in many ways, it's, it's got a lot of holes in it. It has a lot of gaps. And when we map that kind of data against other data that also has its own gaps and holes, you can actually magnify these kinds of problems rather than resolving them. So in many ways, we think that in terms of how we approach this as researchers, a lot of it is transparency and actually coming clean about the process of where this data came from, how we're interpreting it, and also recognizing that our own identity and our own perspective will actually inform our analysis. One little final point here, I think, which is an interesting story that many of you know, but there can be some spectacular errors when researchers try to hard bake social science findings into technological systems. So Friendster is, is your classic case in point. They were very interested in Robin Dunbar's work, which suggested that at any one moment in time, a person could only maintain around 150 social relationships in their network. And they thought, well, this, this makes a lot of sense. We're setting up a social network. We will hard bake into it a maximum number, which they chose to be 200, slightly above 150 maximum. Of course, this was a terrible error, but it's an understandable one, because in many ways, they weren't thinking about the fact that this research was working on the assumption of time, which is at any one time, you could only have this number of connections. And of course, these networks represent connections over an extended period of time. It also works on the assumption that people were replicating their existing social networks in these spaces, rather than augmenting them and changing them. So by looking at cases like this, I think we can see that interpretation is at the center of analysis. And regardless of the size of a data set, it is always subject to limitation and bias. And I think big data is at its most effective when researchers essentially admit to these kinds of limitations and recognize the complex methodological processes that can be used from the social sciences as well. The third provocation um, is that bigger data are not always better data. Right? Social scientists have long argued that their work is, um, is rigorous because it's rooted in its methodological uh, traditions, its analysis, its approach to thinking systematically about what it does. And each field has its own traditions about exactly what it does to, to root it in some sort of methodological sense. Right? Ethnographers are rich in their ideas of reflexivity. You have experimenters who are very much about control. You see a whole set of different approaches, all of which are deeply thought out. Part of what we argue is, is that in choosing what data makes sense, a lot of it is about choosing what methods make sense, what questions need to be asked, and where these things come together. And the assumption that bigger is inherently better causes huge problems in, in both how this work is being done and how it's being espoused. Um, we would argue that you actually have to acknowledge the biases of your system and you have to really think through what the mechanisms of, of analysis are and the mechanisms of data collection are. One of the ways in which we're seeing this play out has to do with the social media. And you'll notice we're focusing heavily on social media because we're social media researchers. We recognize that these are other issues in different fields. 
But one of the things, places that uh, we see this playing out over and over again has to do with Twitter. I've been reviewing a lot of Twitter papers lately, and I'm really fascinated by how everybody sort of puts their methodology section and says, we have millions of tweets. And I'm just like, so what? I don't care about what your millions of tweets are. I want to know what tweets they are, how they were acquired, why you've chosen those tweets, what the biases are, et cetera, et cetera. These are not questions that tend to be asked. The assumption is, is that bigger is inherently better, right? It also means that we see a lot of collision of concepts that come with this, right? With this rhetoric of bigger isn't better. One of the ones that I sort of find fascinating in the world of Twitter is this assumption that people equals users equals accounts. And I want to take a moment to sort of challenge this, right? When you're talking about Twitter, you can't talk about all people. As Esther has pointed out this morning, or earlier this afternoon, time zones are really fun, um, as she pointed out, the idea of who's on Twitter is a very biased population to begin with. So you can't extrapolate from Twitter and assume you're talking about X percent of people. Right? That's an inherent problem. Luckily, that's mostly faded away, but not entirely. The bigger challenge that I've seen is this sort of uh, collision between what are users and accounts. Right? And we have to acknowledge that users and accounts are not the same thing. Right? Who uses a system? They may have one account. They may have no account, but just go onto the site separately. They may have multiple accounts. Right? And we have to actually untangle what all of these different things are. Finally, with the notion of accounts, there's this assumption that there are active accounts, as though active are this sort of, you know, wonderful example of what it means to really be participatory, and yet there's no acknowledgement about the importance of listening, the importance of lurking, the importance of following, the importance of paying attention that may not leave traces in the production of content. Right, so as we think about what all of those elements are, we have to actually think about the precision, how we're speaking about these things, and not automatically collide these terms um, as though they're one and the same. We need to know exactly who we're talking about and when we can talk about that in general. Of course, the other important element to this is that we're never talking about all tweets. No matter what data set you're working with, this is not all tweets. At the very least, other than Twitter the company, nobody has access to all protected tweets. Right? So off the bat, we're, not we're talking about a certain kind of public tweets. But then it becomes a challenge of which tweets even in the public stream. For those who don't work with Twitter um, data sets, you should know that there are different streams that come out. The, the biggest stream is called the fire hose, and only a handful of people, a handful of companies, and it is typically proprietary companies, have access to the fire hose. Fire hose is, in theory, all tweets, but it's not actually even all tweets. I'm very interested in all the people who've chosen to be removed from the fire hose. I'm very humored by the US Department of Defense's choice to be removed from the fire hose. So even in the context of the fire hose, we're not seeing all tweets. Then we have to deal with what academics typically work with, which are usually called the garden hose, which is supposedly 10% of the fire hose, and the spritzer, which is supposedly 1% of the fire hose. Yet the challenge with each of these is we don't know which 10% or which 1%. Are we talking about you know, a random sample? Are we talking about 10% on a particular server? Is any content removed from here? Certainly the US Department of Defense is, but what else is being removed? What else is being um, pulled away? We certainly see this with the trending topics. Um, for those of you who are not obsessed with teen culture like I am. Um, you might not know that Justin Bieber would be the top trending topic every day, all 10 accounts in almost every district, if it wasn't for Twitter's decision to remove Justin Bieber from the um, trending topics on a daily basis, um, and all of the other references to Justin Bieber. If you don't know who Justin Bieber is, you're very much in luck, and keep it that way. <laughs> um, although I really recommend looking at Mary, because she looks exactly like him. Um, <laughs> So part of, it, <laughs> part of it is that we really need to ask, what is it that the data sets that we're working with? And what does it mean to be thinking about the biases embedded there? Choose the data set that fits the methodology, that fits the questions that are being asked. The questions can be asked at scale. So again, it's about acknowledging the right data for the things. Provocation number four, not all data are equivalent. So, because we see that researchers assume that if we have small data, we can do it better with bigger data, the assumption is also that there's a property of transitivity in data, which I always find to be another really fascinating um, element. Nowhere am I seeing this uh, sort of more saliently than the world of social network analysis, right? And the idea that all networks can be reduced to graphs and can be compared to one another and then pop outcomes theory. Um, yet, taken out, of, taken out of context, data quickly loses its meaning, it quickly loses its value. The context is critical. But I think that we should look at how some of these things are playing out, so I'm going to, again, deep dive into another example to sort of locate this. Now, 
for those, those like Barry who have been in the world of social networks for a very long time, we recognize that this dates back to the 1950s. Early sociology and anthropology have been very much involved in a whole set of questions about what social networks are. Social network analysis as a field um, sort of popped out in, the, in this period. Um, I guess early relationship stuff goes even further than the 50s. But you know, we have this moment, we've lo been looking at social networks um, in different forms, even in the frame of social network analysis for a good 60 years. Um, and so when we look at these things, we've built a set of theories, we've built a, a set of understanding that are rooted in what we're actually looking at. Now, technology has introduced new kinds of networks, um, and we see a lot of sort of movement between them. I'll reference uh, two different kinds of moves because I think they're important. If we understand what sociologists have been looking at as personal networks, which of course is one of the terms that's used in that community, um, we can recognize that there's a whole set of methods about how to actually uh, determine whether or not somebody is a part of the personal network, a whole set of ideas about how to measure that and what meaning making is happening. But in the world of computation, we see two other kinds of social networks popping out and being relevant here. Um, one is the articulated social network. This is the list of people that you publicly put um, as your friends on Facebook. This is the people that you list um, in your address book. These are the people you've chosen to articulate as your relations. Right? And again, as we think about these as data traces, we think about large um, access to these articulated networks. The third um, uh, sort of kind of network that we see are behavioral networks, right? And behavioral networks, the idea is that, you know, if I've got my cell phone on me and I can see literally who I've called or who I've shared a, a, a data cell with at any given point, different ways of actually seeing and mapping behavior. I've been shocked to see how many people assume that these are all inherently the same, right? And they're not. And nowhere can we see this more than with conversations of tie strength. Um, so in the world of tie strength, we have uh, sort of two different things popping up. One is the idea that um, top friends on things like MySpace are clearly your bestest friends in the whole wide world, right? The most important ties out there, um, which is a sort of misreading on what's going on there. And secondly, we have this idea that whoever you're actually in a shared cell with or whoever you're actually calling on a regular basis, these must be um, your closest friends because you've spent so much time with them. Well. My mother would be horrified by this, um, in part because she's not on Facebook and therefore doesn't exist in my articulated network. Um, and I would love to pretend like I call her the most, but that's not true. Um, and yet I would argue by any measurement that a sociologist would go by, she would be one of the strongest ties in my network. Right? So part of it is, is that we have to understand what it is that we're measuring as we move across these different spaces. And again, this is something that in the world of social science we get at some guttural level, but it becomes a critical conversation to ha be happening, especially as we think about the uh, collisions between computer science um, and social sciences. The fifth provocation is that just because it's ac um, accessible doesn't mean it's ethical to be used. Right? We're seeing a lot of radically changing social norms, a lot of things that are happening here, but there's this assumption of like, wee, we see data, we can use data, that's all great. We shouldn't ask any ethics questions. And this becomes a huge problem. So in 2006, um, a Harvard-based research project started collecting the profiles of uh, 1,700 college students at an anonymous college um, that were all part of the same cohort um, in order to look at their interests and friendships and how this changed over time. Of course, this anonymous network became quickly recognized as a particular class of the Harvard um, undergraduate population, and it sparked a whole set of controversies about what it means to have this data out there. right? What does it mean that we can de-anonymize data? What does it mean in terms of uses? What does it mean in terms of the privacy of students? What does it mean in terms of opting in? There's a lot of confusion, a lot of questions. Of course, what we've seen is the response is to clamp down on it rather to ask some of the critical questions of what's going on. So I think that one of the places we have to think through is what do we talk about when we talk about privacy? What does it mean when we talk about accountability and confidentiality? All of these, as Christine has pointed out, these are some of the key questions that we start to have to struggle with, and there's no clean answers to it. But with big data emerging as a, f a research field, there's not a lot of conversations happening about ethics. Again, this is a space where social scientists have had a long-standing set of conversations about ethics and data that we haven't necessarily seen in other fields, but it becomes really important to have those conversations. So you know, what happens when we think about the content as being public? Public to whom? For what purposes? In what ways should it be used? How can it be recontextualized or decontextualized? These are questions not just for the market, but they're also questions for the researchers. Now, of course, it may be unreasonable to ask researchers to think about consent for every person um, who posts a tweet, but we actually do have to have the conversations about ethics, and that conversation has to happen across fields. Now, it's interesting. Um, Christine mentioned uh, institutional review boards earlier, and I think they're really important to highlight here. So 
there's no doubt that IRBs are completely clueless about what's going on, right? They don't know what ends up on any of this stuff. But when we go back to the 1970s and we listen through the discussions um, of human subjects and the goals of the IRBs, the goals are still relevant today. Right? And the goals are really about creating a conversation about ethics and really pondering through what it means to be an ethical researcher, what it means to be an ethical worker with data. We feel as though these, these issues must be brought into the present day, in part because it really brings up questions of truth, control, and power, all of which are extraordinarily relevant in an era of big data. Researchers have tools and access, while well, social media users do not. So how do we think about them and their agency? How do we think about the agency of the companies that are being involved in this? How do we think about the context that's going on? And how do we actually have a conversation around ethics that, of people that are actually understanding big data? Don't just reject it as a question of what will get you sued or not, but actually come in and have a serious conversation about ethics. Finally, there's something really important about recognizing that there's a huge difference between content being public and people being in a public. A lot of people use social media to participate in a public, to be a part of a public conversation, but they're not thinking about being public. They're not thinking of publishing or publicizing their content. So there's a moment we have to have questions of what's going on. And the final provocation is about new digital divides. Well, certainly part of the great enthusiasm about big data is that there is this easy access to massive amounts of information. But we would ask who gets access, for what purposes, in what contexts, and with what constraints. This is something that Lev Manovich has written about in relation to the fact that it's actually social media companies who have the best possible access to this data. So if you're an anthropologist who's working at Google, or you're a sociologist working at Facebook, your capacity to do research with this data is so much greater than somebody from the outside. So I'm just going to very quickly talk about some of the restrictions that we think are really important when we talk about big data. And the first, of course, is cash. Uh, some media companies simply don't give away their data at all, and this is particularly true of transactional data. Others sell it for an incredibly high price. Others will give away a very small subset to university researchers. But what is interesting about this process is that it produces considerable unevenness in the system. Those who have money and access can produce the kind of research that those who are on the periphery cannot. And significantly, those who are on the periphery can't then go back to those data sets to evaluate the methodological claims or try to actually you know, repeat those studies if they don't have privileged access. This plays out, I think, in some really problematic ways at a university level. Of course, your top tier, well-resourced universities can afford to buy access to this data. In many cases, that might be something like the Twitter firehose. They can then train their students in how to use it. Those students are then more likely to get those coveted positions at technology companies where they can then go and be postdocs or they can be interns. Those at the universities who aren't so well-resourced are not going to get that training and they're not going to have those doors open to them in such a straightforward way. So I'm concerned at this point that we start to see divisions between the top universities and the rest actually start to widen significantly. In addition to questions of access, there are always going to be questions of skills. So wrangling APIs, scraping all this data, analyzing it, this is a skill set which we traditionally relate to the computational disciplines. But when computational skills are being positioned as the most valuable without looking at the way in which computational work and social science work can actually reflect on each other, we see a real hierarchy emerging in terms of who can read the numbers. So I think in this way, we have to ask as university teachers, lecturers, professors, as indeed I am, how we are interested in teaching our students. What sort of skills do we want to give them? Do we want to make them as comfortable in reading and writing algorithms as they are with reading and writing social theory? And let's be frank, this is also a gender division. So at the moment, the majority of people who have these skills are actually male. And as we've seen from many feminist historians and philosophers of science, if you look at who is asking the question, it will determine the kinds of questions that get asked. So in actual fact, this issue around the gender divide is not a small one. And finally, there's the question of the kind of restricted set of research questions that are being asked. Now, because social media companies, for example, are under no obligation to give away their data, they don't have to. If you're one of the lucky few who have that access, 
Are you going to ask questions that are going to make them feel uncomfortable or that might embarrass them publicly? I think not, because they can actually cut off your access. So this produces some fairly disturbing chilling effects around the sorts of research questions that are being pursued. So we'd like to leave you with the provocation that possibly what we're seeing at the moment is the creation of a class of the data rich and a class of the data poor, and that there will be ways in which this will be replicated over time through the university system. And I think we can see already that from certain media companies who are saying, you know, we have the data, we don't actually encourage other researchers to do this because if they're not on the inside, they're not going to have what we have, is the creation of a class of insiders and a class of outsiders. This is not new when it comes to research, but we think that it should be brought into question when people start to evangelise about the role of big data. So in sum, as is probably clear, um, we think there are some fairly serious and wide-ranging implications for the move towards big data and what that will mean for future research agendas. And to be really clear at this point, we're not suggesting that this is being driven by the academy. Not at all. There is a deep concern coming from industry and from government to collect massive amounts of data and to maximise the kind of analysis that can be done. This could be information that might lead to more targeted advertising, it could be product design, it could be traffic, it could be criminal policing in our cities. But as Lucy Suchman writes, and I think she's dead on, uh, we are our tools. And if we don't consider the tools and how they actually constitute the world while we are using them, they're actually the ones who are running the show and not us. So while the big, you know, big data era is well and truly underway, we think it's really important that we take a moment to start questioning its assumptions and its biases, because we, as researchers, all have a stake. Thanks. Thank you. So the question I still ask is, what data? Because this comes back to a question of interpretation, right? Because from my point of view, there is not a notion of all data. There's a lot that has to do with the analytic lens through which you're even understanding the data, which produces metadata, and we get into all of these recursions of data, which I can't imagine a world of all data. Can I have a whole data set of a particular technology and a particular thing? Sure. But that doesn't actually give me all the data. Um, and that's where, you know, I, I guess as trained as an ethnographer, part of it is, is that I believe that you're constantly going in, you're constantly trying to understand things, and there's an ongoing data production process. Now, of course, to the theory question, I think that theory is absolutely essential. You know, again, in my training, my whole foundation is to take theory and be constantly in conversation, and that the power of theory is that theory is in conversation with data at the collection process and at the analysis process, and that that is an ongoing and lifelong process as well. So, you know, when I think about theory, I know that even when I go back to existing data sets that I've already played with, when I start to look at it with new theoretical lenses, I start to actually analyze and see different things and different issues pop out. So I guess for me, I don't see a notion of whole data or even, even the notion of whole theory, aside from the fact that it would be a lifelong to learn it, but a whole set of processes. And to me, what's so fascinating about research is that research is a process. Uh, Bernie Hogan, Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, one uh, an additional provocation that I did not hear a, a lot of, uh, and is uh, instead of kowtowing to the data overloads, uh, is perhaps reflecting on the statistical monks uh, of the world. You know, we big data lead to big issues with statistics. Um, I think a lot of these problems are coming not from people with access to big data, but people with access to big data and terrible statistical training. <laughs> you, can, you, can generate, uh, you can generate algorithms that are run infinitely long on 30 nodes in a network. You know, exponential random graphs have ne needed to be optimized for years, and they will never work in their current form on 100, 200 nodes. And these are the sort of techniques that are required to ask very simple questions like, 
if I have two friends, are those friends going to become friends with each other more than average? Very simple questions that, you know, when you try to do all the permutations of what possibly could happen, you'll, you know, then trying to do that on a huge scale will simply be, um, simply be unheralded. So I, I really want to make a return to not just the big data is better data, but theorizing how we can sample this data, how we can winnow it down and under what conditions we winnow it down, and actually then start bending it to ask questions that have to uh, answers about probability, uh, answers about likelihood. Otherwise, we're simply, uh, I guess, you know, back with this uh, Joey Ito quote, you know, sort of chasing the dragon, and we're always doing very retroactive work that's atheoretical and extremely presentist. Thank you, Bernie. That's a fantastic point. And I think your work is a case where we can see how large data sets are being used really well in a very qualified sense. But this really gets back to the question of skills. And I think Christine raised this very early on in the piece, that we are talking about a set of skills that are really not that common. Particularly the people who might want to be asking those questions in the first place might not actually have the skill sets to produce the kinds of answers that they're looking for. So to some degree, this is where I think collaboration is actually really important and the kinds of encouragement towards collaboration that we heard from Esther earlier today is really significant. But it really is going to be a slow process of teaching and Forgive me for you know being obsessed with pedagogy, but I really think that's where it has to happen. It actually has to happen in the training process because what I'm concerned about is seeing a split where you have, oh, here are the people who do the stats, here are the people who do the, you know, the social research thinking. What I think is more useful are ways in which they can genuinely collaborate and in some cases, skill share as well. So I think, I agree entirely with Kate, and I think your point is actually even more powerful when we think about how those skills aren't just a matter of not having learned, but not having been invented. And I think there's a lot of statistical um, skills, or, not, or statistical knowledge that we're just not yet at because we're dealing with large scales. And I, I'm appreciating of um, uh, the astrophysics community for their interest in, in that kind of statistical work, but I feel like there's a lot to be invented in many ways. So one of the things um, I'm really interested in is one is this obsession with power, right, which is that the statistical power when you're dealing with a large data set, you get such high correlations over and over again that you assume that anything could be correlated, which is a big problem. So I think that we have to have a new set of questions about that. The other thing that's been really clear to me in industry is that industry is also running into these specific technical questions. So your question about sampling becomes relevant not just to researchers, but also to um, technologists. So for example, for those who don't, don't know how architects or ar architect architectures work, um, Twitter is not just on one database, right? It's not just on one system. It's spread out, spread out across a ton of different computers, and you talk about it in terms of shards. So there are different shards on different things. The thing is, is that the data access needed to actually go after one shard is really costly. So you're trying to minimize the number of different machines that you possibly go at. The result of which is you're trying to distribute data across the machines so that it's most likely to be in the kind of think of it as the sector of universe that's related to other things like it. So if you're looking for Justin Bieber, you want the entire world to be over there of Justin Bieber and all of his fans. The challenge is, is that as I talk to Twitter and, and their sharding issues, this is one of the main reasons that they don't even know how to sample their own data in order to actually provide a network structure that they could even distribute across the shards, let alone to provide you a subsample of Twitter data that would make sense as any form of representative, let alone even a subsection of the graph. Right, so we have all of these issues, and this is a, another great opportunity where not only do we have to figure it out for scholarly reasons, but we should actually be having a conversation across industry and the academy about what the future of statistics look like. Um, so just to play devil's advocate for that, Perfect. I'm thinking about some of your statements about um, social media companies and, and their kind of imperative to share data more openly and not just kind of privileged um, institutions. And so thinking back to Christine's talk about the motivations for sharing research, so the research driven or more uh, public good, and those aren't really, you know, as relevant for them. Um, you know, you've also talked about the, well, both the talks actually, spend a lot of time um, on the, you know, the difficulties of just kind of throwing data up into the web and not providing metadata or not contextualizing or trying to anonymize it, which you also talked about. So I, so I guess I just would be curious, you know, given that these are you know, for-profit institutions and not, you know, academic entities, what, what do you think would be the benefits that they would, I mean, what, what kinds of benefits would you like to articulate to these companies in terms of their, um, 
So I was speaking, then I'll let Kate finish. Um, my interest is is that there's a rhetoric in the technology industry that is about openness, and it's about open source, and it's about this. My favorite is to sort of poke at that and be like, openness to what extent? What is that value? And how do you actually call into question their own conflicting values around these things? And that's actually usually where I see people go, I hadn't thought of it that way, right? And that's a, that's, it's a serious moment. I think that there's a lot of knowledge and lessons to be learned, which is why all of these companies are bringing social scientists, statisticians, et cetera, in-house. The question is, is that can they actually gain more at scale from doing it in a more distributed manner? One of the biggest challenges for them is that it's often not that they don't want to share, it's often that the um, mechanisms by which they can share are often really hard, right? Even just Putting resources in terms of engineering talent to make data available is really hard and costly. And so there's all of these other issues. So I think part of it is to understand within the technical framework is what are the right mindsets that they're working at? What can be done at scale? How could it be done so that it's not just giving it to one researcher here, one researcher here, one research here, but like what would it mean to have a team of researchers across different universities who teamed up to be in collaboration? What would it mean to offer engineering resources to help that process? And there are some other possibilities there, but I think that it's going to—it's really going to depend on each particular company and what they gain or lose from it. Um, and as we've said before, there's some major issues in terms of what questions they like and which questions they don't. I'm really aware we're running short on time, so a, a quick answer that I would give you would be that I think it's our responsibility. If I look at the sorts of changes that have occurred in terms of how you access data from Twitter, for example, it has been pressure from outside academics that have been saying, we really need to get access to this data in different ways. And that external pressure is actually significant. The difficulty is these companies are not beholden to us. They, have, they don't have to give us this data. But I think if we work with them and when need be, actually bring some leverage to these discussions to say collectively, we want to see this data get out there. We don't want to see these hierarchies emerge around who has it and who doesn't. That's actually going to be quite an important front for activism, I think, in future. And we just had one final question over here, I think, um, before. I, I would just say that in addition, I'm sorry, Ray Bunko from Lock Haven University, that in addition to this skills divided, and, and maybe you haven't named it to, to be gracious, that it's a field of study divide, right? Because the, the people who have the skills to write the algorithms generally are people who have training in conducting social science research and then who don't have training in uh, keeping things confidential and the ethics about keeping data confidential and you, you know how you might anonymize that and why it's important to anonymize that. So, so it, you know, just in addition to that, that I think that, um, that some, it, we need to find some ways to focus on educating those who, you know, in academia we have IRB and, and I serve on our IRB, I can't believe I just admitted that in public, <laughs> but, um, you know, in IRB, at least they'll come through IRB and say, all right, all right, we'll do this, we'll do this, you, you know, but, but it's clear that those in the physical sciences who may start doing more social science research aren't really, easy. it's not even on the radar to think about these mm -hmm. questions. Okay, um, we're just about, well, we're actually a couple minutes past the, the most important part of, of a conference, which is informal discussions to follow these things up. But I want to take the chairman's liberty with one final provocation for, for Dana and Kate, which is what if they're right? I mean, I drive a BMW, which is a masterpiece of automated engineering, but it's still not a Morgan. Such, they still exist. Uh, it's not hand built. It's not running away from wood. Um, what if the automated statistical folks can actually get more powerful stuff and cheaper and throw us out of business? Uh, Dana will have to think about that over the break. I'm sure you already have. 